So repeal day was December 5th, 1933. So today we are going to run through six or so uh, prohibition cocktails. We're going to rip them out fast. There's people with stopwatches back there. This is a timed episode because the Treasury Department has been informed of our little speakeasy rock guts location and they are on the way. So I got to bang these out. First things I want to get out of the way really quickly is just a quick talk about Prohibition. One, there's this myth out there that cocktails were invented during Prohibition. That is obviously bull****. Cocktails predate Prohibition by a long shot. In fact, cocktails that were invented by Prohibition, very few of them remain in the classics lexicon. Prohibition was a huge setback to cocktail culture. In fact, it, it, it set things back. Ingredients got, drinks got pared down, everything got simplified. All of the great bartenders had to flee America to continue their trade, and the people who stayed here were basically, you know, criminals. Two, uh, prohibition. How the heck did that even happen? How did we get this passed? Well, there had been a temperance movement in the United States that had been going for a really long time, uh, mostly led by women. It's kind of like the, one of the first feminist movements in America, and that sounds from modern ears, maybe a little bit weird, but you have to remember that saloons at the time were men only. They were huge, massive affairs. The, the saloons of pre-prohibition era, usually they were sponsored by a beer company. Uh, so the beer company would come in and it would be like, they talk about the free lunch, there'd be free sandwiches, stuff like that for men. There was no television, there was very little radio, men, people had very little stuff to do. There was a, a kind of a culture that said that if a man went to work, he could go. Long story short, people were drinking. People were drinking a lot. People prior to prohibition drank way more heavily than they do today. And it was just sort of accepted that people drank most of the day. They were partially drunk at all times. It was a common thing that men would spend all of their money in the bar, have nothing left to feed their wives or kids, who obviously were not working. Their kids might have been working. Ooh. Um, ooh, mm. And then beat their wives. It was terrible. The saloon became a specter of uh, male oppression of women. And so there was a massive movement to curtail its use, temperance. This was never gonna catch on around America. In a few pockets it did, some cities, some towns, some counties, even a few states, if I'm not mistaken, adopted prohibition prior to nationwide prohibition. Um, a couple of notables who were champions of the cause include, of course, Carrie Nation, very famous for storming in the saloons and taking them apart with a hatchet. She started with rocks, she evolved to a hatchet. It's not a joke. She would just run in and say, if you guys are here tomorrow, I am gonna start busting the place up, come back the next day, and she just started busting the place up. Um, she did not f around. Like a Joan of Arc of old maids. Uh, she assaulted people. I don't think she ever murdered anybody, no, yeah. Um, she definitely like bloodied people into comas, so. So how did nationwide prohibition happen? Uh, some elements within the temperance cause aligned forces with an anti-immigrant cause in America, a nativist cause, and they managed to marry the idea of drinking, of alcohol consumption, with being foreign or Catholic. You have to remember that, of course, now Catholics are an accepted part of society. They were a minority in America for a really long time and a trodden upon minority. People did not like, uh, Protestant America did not like Catholics. Catholics are listed as one of the hated elements, according to the KKK. So just put that in perspective. Catholics drank during mass. It was used, uh, that was, a, and, and a lot of the new immigrants coming from various places in Europe were Catholics, okay? Uh, Irish, Italian immigrants, um, Amer uh, and German, and, and of course Germans were, uh, believe it or not, Germans who were not Catholics by and large, or a, lot, a lot of them were Lutheran, uh, they also drank. All of this allowed uh, anti-alcohol movement in America to get in bed with an anti-immigrant movement, and there it is, that was the recipe for success for them. They managed to outlaw drinking because they couldn't outlaw people. They wanted to. Very, very similar to um, what has happened with a lot of other kinds of prohibition and creating a moral panic around immigration. America really loves moral panics based around immigration. That is our bread and f butter. There are a couple of great sources for this. There's books written about it that I will list when I have a chance. Also, I think that the documentary Ken Burns did is excellent. It can be a little bit dry. If you're looking for something I think even more um, easily to easy to ingest, Check out American History Teller's podcast. He did a six-episode arc on Prohibition that I thought was absolutely fantastic. 
uh, really did a great job of connecting the dots and making the case for how this all happened um, and, and what were the actual ramifications. One thing that I always like to correct people about is that Prohibition actually worked. Yes, people still drank during Prohibition. Yes, it created an enormous crime wave. Uh, it empowered mobsters and never-do-wells of all sorts, bootleggers, to uh, defraud the country and to do incredible harm and damage to people. But if the goal was to reduce drinking throughout America, they did it because prior to Prohibition, people drank a lot more then than they do now. A lot more, like way more. We're talking about cocktails from Prohibition. Not a huge number of the famous cocktails come from Prohibition. One of the ones that comes from Prohibition that people say is a great drink is the sidecar. We're gonna make that right now. That is a shaken drink. We're gonna make it in a shaker. Um, it's not entirely clear who invented this or where. Harry McAlone credits Pat McGarry of the Buck Club in London, and I'm grabbing the wrong liquor right now, I want this one, uh, with inventing this, but the Ritz-Carlton Hotel of Paris also claims credit. As a result, there diverged a, a two schools, a London school and a Paris school. I am making uh, what I think is kind of a London school variation here. Whatever the case, uh, rimming the glass in sugar, which is definitely now a standard of the drink, does not seem to show up until 1934. We're gonna do it anyway because that's how you would make this drink now. And honestly, I really do think it adds something to this drink. I think that this is a drink that it's easy to have be under-sweetened, and I'm not a fan of it when it's under-sweetened at all. So one ounce of lemon juice. I'm gonna cut a lemon in half right now and juice that. One ounce of lemon juice. I'm gonna save the other half of this lemon because we're making a lot of drinks. I want one ounce of orange liqueur. I'm gonna use dry curacao. I'm probably gonna use dry curacao for all of these. And I want two ounces of cognac, Pierre Ferrand cognac. I like Pierre Ferrand because reasons. Uh, it's made <clears throat> kind of to spec for the time period, for a pre-prohibition time period, but still a very good choice. The other thing I wanna do is I wanna rim my glass with sugar. I'm gonna do a half a rim. Uh, when you rim a glass, you definitely wanna use a citrus juice, and you can get that just by rolling it across the side of your, there, like that, that's enough. And then I'm just gonna take that and roll that in my plate of sugar. There we go, our glass is rimmed. Halfway around or so. One big and one cracked. Okay. And we'll double strain these for speed. Okay, and there we have a sidecar. Let's give it a quick taste. Mm, it's a wonderful sour, very well balanced. Sour, tart, crisp, bright, fresh, lemon, sugar, citrus. Delicious, moving on. Next drink is one that I've actually never had before. This is a Mary Pickford, named for the silent film star Mary Pickford. It was invented upon her occasion of visiting the Hotel de Nacional Cuba uh, on a visit down to Havana with her friend, Charlie Chaplin and her husband, Douglas Fairbanks. Uh, those three, plus D.W. Griffith, by the way, founded United Artists together, so she was one of the first producer actresses, uh, a real mogul in Hollywood, a real force to be reckoned with. Uh, this drink was invented at the bar there. There is a little bit of disagreement about who specifically invented it. It was either invented by, it was either invented by Fred Kaufman or Eddie Wolk, or Eddie Wolk. A little bit of disagreement there. Uh, nonetheless, it calls for Bacardi. Uh, it calls for Bacardi, and that's what we're going to use, even though Bacardi is probably not exactly made the same way anymore. Um, we're going to start with a bar spoon of maraschino. Want a quarter ounce of grenadine, which I, fortunately is a little bit buried back here. Get to it. Okay. Um, a quarter ounce of grenadine. Always make your own grenadine or buy it from a reputable supplier. Don't buy roses. One and a half ounces of pineapple juice. I happen to have that right here. And two ounces of Bacardi white rum. If you're not gonna use Bacardi, I would steer away from um, English style rums. Like, don't, don't do a Jamaican rum here. Stick with something, if you can, I mean, I think of a Havana Club, Three year would probably be the best choice here. I don't have any. 
put some ice in that, shake it, and strain it. Put this into a sour glass, and away she goes. have a Mary Pickford. I had the idea that it would be nice to garnish that with a pair of blackberries. I don't know why I got that from. It's not part of the recipe. I just like the idea. Okay, Mary Pickford, here we are. That's a great drink. Uh, Mary Pickford is a sweet rum grenadine expression. The pineapple shines in that. You really get that. Is it too sweet? Maybe. I think you would temper that by dragging back the maraschino a little bit from a bar spoon, like a half bar spoon or a dash or something like that. You want some of that in there. Um, that might be just a tad sweet for my taste. <clears throat> of course, how sweet your grenadine is going to how sweet your grenadine is is going to be a huge factor here. Okay, next up is the bee's knees. This is an expression you may know from Prohibition. Uh, means awesome, the bee's knees, to be super great. Uh, this drink, I'm gonna make in this copper shaker. Uh, this is a honey and gin drink. I'm gonna start by adding one ounce of lemon juice to my shaker. I need one ounce of honey syrup. Honey syrup is an easy thing to make. It is an equal parts mix of honey and water. It just makes it so that you can work with honey in a bar and pour it. Honey doesn't like to pour. And I want two ounces of London Dry Gin. I'm gonna use Ford's Gin, certainly an appropriate gin here. Put some ice in that shaker and we're off to go. You're off to the races. I'll put some ice in there. Doesn't specifically need a garnish, but I thought it would be nice with a piece of ginger candy. Yes, there's no ginger in this drink. I just like ginger candy, or candy ginger, I should say. I think it goes well with the flavors present here. Okay, here we are. This is the bee's knees. What a lovely drink. Actually super well balanced. The lemon, and the honey and the gin really work together in the most delightful way. It is not too sweet, not too tart. It is just on the right line. Honey can be a very powerful flavor, but here it is tempered by the gin and the lemon. It has an, an experience not unlike a, like a honey lemon tea thing you might have when you're sick, except it's cold and filled with gin, which is great. So we're three down, a few more to go. My notes say that I was gonna do a last word here, but I'm gonna skip that. I think the last word could be a subject of its own uh, entire episode. I just want to mention that it is in fact a prohibition drink and that it was probably invented at the Detroit Athletic Club. Moving on, we're going to do a monkey gland. This one is one of my favorites, if only because of its name. It was invented by Harry McElhone at Harry's New York Bar in Paris, which can be confusing to some people. Harry's New York Bar was in Paris. Uh, it's worth noting that Frank Mir also claims to have created this drink. I do think that it was probably Harry McElhone. I don't really know. It's a monkey gland. It, that name is a reference to the practice of Dr. Dr. Sergei Voronov, who claimed to be able to cure your gentlemanly problems, it made your dick stand up, by implanting a monkey's testicle into your scrotum. Maybe it works, probably not. I'm gonna put this in a sour glass from Riedel. And we're going to start by doing an absinthe rinse. I have an atomizer here from Barfly Mixology Gear. I'm gonna use that to just put a couple spritzes of absinthe in my glass. Ooh, wow, that just went right over my head. There we go, that's a perfectly atomized, spritzed absinthe glass. Excuse me, I am sticky everywhere. As to shake and drink, so we're gonna shake it. I'm gonna shake it in the first shaker that fell into my hand. One quarter ounce of grenadine goes into my shaker. 
Oh, one ounce of orange juice. Not a lot of drinks have orange juice in it. A lot of people think it's too sweet or that it can be overpowering. There's a few drinks that it works really well in. It's called for in this drink. I'm not even claiming this is a great drink. I am telling you this is a prohibition drink that was invented during prohibition. That's what I'm getting at here. And I need one and a half ounces of London Dry Gin. I'm gonna go with Ford's Gin. We're keeping it all pretty much the same here. Okay, one and a half ounces. Whoa, stand up there, baby. Put some ice into my shaker, shake the sucker up and strain it. One monkey gland coming right up for you. Uh, this drink doesn't quite get to the wash line I want, so for close-up purposes, we'll be doubling its re uh, ratios here, doubling the size of it. Okay, this is the monkey gland, here we go. Easy to drink. Boy, that's tasty. A little sweet, not too sweet. A grenadine and orange juice is a great combo, really great. The absinthe is just barely there, just a sweet, sweet little hint of anise. It's a little bit of uh, complexity to this drink. Um, and the gin is kind of vanished, honestly, and, that, and that's real, that's good London Dry gin. I think that uh, if you, I don't think this would work without gin. I think that the gin is synthesizing into a new flavor here with this that is very pleasant. I would not replace the gin with vodka, for example. I think that would ruin this drink. Um, yeah, no, that's a great drink. I really enjoy this. It's, it's a little, um, you know, to be a, a true classic, is this complex enough? Is it dry enough? No. Uh, but it's a, it's a tasty drink, people will enjoy it, and the, the story of the monkey gland is fun. Uh, I don't have a garnish on this, but if you had some uh, chimpanzee testicles, that would be the way to go, perfect. We should make um, monkey gland garnish kits, it'd be like a strap with like a pair of little blue balls that hangs here, like truck nuts. It'd be great, it's a great thing, that's gonna be the first how to drink product. Now we're gonna make a scufflaw. Now. According to Gaz Reagan, Gary Reagan, inventor of Ga Gary Reagan's orange bitters, the word scofflaw was invented uh, as a result of a newspaper contest to invent a word to describe people who were drinking against the law. Scofflaw was decided upon as the best entrant into the contest. It won, and immediately a cocktail had to be made called a scofflaw. This is that cocktail. The 1924 version of this drink is a little bit different. I am gonna go with Gaz's version here because I think that the rebalancing makes a lot of sense in light of modern palettes and modern um, modern ingredients. But if you want the 1924 version of the drink, I'm gonna put it in the show notes. The main difference is that the vermouth and the rye are equal parts in that version. Here they are not. I have a shaker, we're gonna shake. Two dashes of orange bitters. Of course, I'm using Gary Reagan's Gaz's orange bitters. I want a quarter ounce of lemon juice. That will probably still use it. I want a half an ounce of grenadine. Should keep that more handy. A lot of these prohibition drinks, lots of grenadine. They loved it back then. Oh, one ounce of dry vermouth. I'm going to use Noily Pratt Extra Dry. And I want two ounces of rye. We're gonna use Rittenhouse bonded, bottled and bond rye. Shake this up. Lot. Feels like that wants a cherry. Let's put a cherry in that. The Scofflaw, uh, Gareth Reagan's formulation. Interesting. That rye, lemon, grenadine combo. Hmm. Not what you would expect. It is much more orchardy, stone fruity than you would expect. Very, um, I know we garnished it with a cherry. You definitely get, I would say, cherry-ish notes out of this. 
nutty notes too. A little bit, mm, slightly malty, very slightly. Pretty nice drink. My favorite drink, pretty nice drink. It's okay. The vermouth adds a really unusual quality to that. It has a, um, yeah, that vermouth is really present in there in a very nice way, actually. I find that to be a really interesting drink, actually. It's not quite like anything I've ever had, so I mean, in, in that regard, I strongly encourage you to try that one out. We're moving on to our last drink, the 12 mile limit. Now, when Prohibition was first signed into law, there was a three mile limit uh, into international waters around the United States. So if you were three miles out at sea, Prohibition didn't apply to you. This allowed <clears throat> people to set up casino boats and anchor them right off the beach with big neon drink at Joe's signs hanging off the sides of them. They would have little motorboat skiffs come and pick people up and haul them out three miles to their casino. It made it very easy to eschew prohibition right around the coast. Um, and they were up and down both coasts, all around the Gulf, everywhere. You could go out to sea and have a drink and come back to the beach. It would be pretty great. Great, right? So they changed the law because that made things very easy and they pushed it out to a 12 mile limit. And there was a cocktail by the name of the three mile limit. It is a perfectly forgettable cocktail. Um, it is not worth bothering to make here. Maybe we'll do it in another episode or something and we do bad old cocktails, I don't know. So they changed the law to a 12 mile limit. Very, very uh, fortunate to the bartending community. Gave them an opportunity to revisit the concept and do a 12 mile limit cocktail that was much, much better. Uh, I do want to pause and mention a pre-code film that is of okay quality, but it's interesting to see an early Cary Grant movie. 1933 Gambling Ship uh, is about that, about gambling ships being anchored off the beach, um, providing gambling and drinking for anybody who felt like felt like it felt like it felt like it this one's very easy to make it is going to be all equal parts we're going to go with a one ounce version of this so it'll be one ounce lemon juice one ounce grenadine one ounce cognac one ounce rye we'll put it in our gold shaker one ounce of lemon juice goes into the cut on my finger goes into my tin one ounce lemon juice in my tin one ounce of grenadine One ounce of cognac. And one ounce of rye. Uh, we're gonna add some ice to this, shake it up and serve it. There we go. I want to garnish this with a lemon twist. Whenever I pull a twist, I like to do it near the glass so that any oils that come flying off wind up in it. Twist it, oh yeah, and lay that across top. There we are, 12 mile limit. That's tasty, that's a tasty little sour. Um, I find it to be on the sweet end, but in a pleasant way. The, the grenadine actually really shines here. And not a lot of drinks really taste of grenadine that include the grenadine. The grenadine comes to the fore, balanced with lemon, which is great. Cognac and rye are good choices here. The cognac, cognac, the cognac provides a nice base. It is warm and, um, you know, fruity in a very, very dry kind of way in the way that a distilled spirit would be. You taste the grape, I would say, the, the raisins to my palate, and the rye, comes in in a little bit of a higher end with that kind of baking spice action. That's, that's a good drink, it's nice. It's very, uh, that's a nice drink, it's very good. Certainly better than the Three Mile, which is not a, a feature of this show. I'm gonna have another sip of this one. Yes, I would say that's, that's well balanced. I like that a lot. It has just the right attack on your mouth. It really, you get like all those flavors coming in at you. That was one, two, three, four, five, six drinks from Prohibition uh, here on How to Drink. And I hope you are having an excellent repeal day and that you are celebrating with a tipple. Thank God we've got that Volstead uh, act off of our backs. We put the mobsters out of business. Obviously, there's no organized crime in America anymore. Um, the Tommy gun, the reign of the Tommy gun, the Chicago typewriter is over. The untouchables are no more. 
No, but seriously, uh, thank you guys so much for watching the show. I hope that you enjoyed this little look at Prohibition cocktails. We did a sidecar, Mary Pickford, Scofflaw, uh, Bee's Knees, a 12 mile limit, and, and a monkey gland. And we did a monkey gland. Yeah, scrotum drink. Scrot. My watches are provided by Crown and Caliber. If you have an interest in watches, why don't you check them out? There's a link in the pinned comment below. All of my barware is provided by Barfly Mixology Gear. If you want to use the tools I use on the show, well, hey, there's a link in the pinned comment below. It's an affiliate link, which means that if you buy anything from there, I do get a little piece of the action, but it doesn't cost you any more money, so I don't know why you would deprive me of that unless you were just needlessly cruel. Uh, all of the glassware I'm using in this episode was purchased from Riedel. They are not a sponsor of this show, but I like the way it looks on camera. It helps me do my job better. If you want to use the glasses I'm using, I'll put a link in the pinned comment. It is an affiliate link. You know what that means. I'm on Twitter at How to Drink. I'm on Instagram at How to Drink. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. And I also have a Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. Uh, I'm on there as often as I can be. I hope you're having a fantastic repeal day. And uh, in the meantime, I hope that you will remember to damn the man, hack the planet, uh, you know, power the people, um, rage against the machine. Some of those who work forces are the same who burn crosses. And prohibition is a crime against humanity. Enjoy yourself a drink. I like these, by the way. Barfly makes metal versions of stupid cocktail swords. I think that's really awesome. If you like this episode, you should check out some of my other episodes right here. No way, man. That's ASMR. We're leaning in.